Uh, good evening. Uh, this lecture is the Fuat Anefesh of Adina Bat Irena and also Chazar B'Tshuva. The Fuat of Yaakov, Israel, Chaim, Ben Yafa, the Mikreya, Diana. And the Ilui Nishmat Lavdil, Adara Bat Uniel. Baruch Hashem, today it's a. It's a special day and dangerous day. The evil people are gathering together in Tehran with their plan to destroy the Jewish people. Of course, you know, that's not the headline of the summit. But Putin is uh, making his connection with Iran tighter than ever before and trying to drag Turkey into the into the unity. So the Iranians are hosting this meeting and uh, the reason why Putin is going to Iran usually doesn't go to a country just like that. It has to be a real good reason. is because they want to make a deal more with the Iranians that they'll buy all their oil. Because they cannot buy oil, they cannot do all kinds of things, they cannot, you know, even though Turkey, uh, uh, Russia themselves has a lot of oil, but they're going to help Iran, they're going to help the Iranians, they're going to make new deals with the Iranians to get some Iranian money, and plus, the Iranian wants to, uh, uh, Russia to help them against Israel in Syria to help them and the Hezbollah. As you know, the Hezbollah is a terror organization, but it's not an organization anymore, it's an army. They have many, many thousands of soldiers and they have more than 100,000 missiles aimed at every city in Israel, almost all the way to Egypt. Some of their uh, some of their uh, missiles are uh, extremely dangerous and large. So, until now, all, every week Israel attacked the Iranians in Syria for the past two years, every week. They bomb the supply, they bomb the weapon, they bomb trucks, they bomb the airport, they bomb all these areas. The Russian had an, an understanding with the Israelis that even though they are there, they're not going to fight us directly. The last thing you want is to start a war with Russia. Not only a nuclear empire, also a very crazy country that can go into a war, as you can see, for nothing. So we don't know what Hashem is preparing. Maybe it's the beginning of Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog is the final war. We're beginning to see the world is splitting to two halves. You know, the evil countries together, those who pro-terrorism, support terrorism. Russia, for instance, is the one behind all the evilness in the world. All the Arab countries in the last 60, 70 years are all supported by Russia. They get weapons from them, airplanes, tanks, oil, whatever they need, money, they build for them nuclear, nuclear facility in Syria that Israel bombed, in Iraq, in Iran. The Russians are behind everything. Nobody can clean Assad in Syria just because Putin is backing him up. They wanted to get rid of him already years ago, gassing his own people. Nobody can do anything. One word of Putin, no one can do anything. It looked like in the beginning of the war, the Russians are collapsing. It didn't go so well for them. The ruble crashed. But now it's a whole different story. The ruble went back up. They found who to sell their oil to. They're managing pretty good. Even though they had many thousands of dead, they don't care. In Israel, if one soldier dies, everyone is depressed. They met one. They show on the news. One Israeli soldier got shot today and, and was found dead. 
half of the people in Israel are depressed for the rest of the night. For one soldier in Russia, they, can, they hear 3,000 soldiers died today. It doesn't look like it bothers anyone. It doesn't look like there's a problem. They, they don't care. Ukraine is destroyed. They go to the end, to hell. Doesn't matter, we'll all die. The value of life over there is completely different than the way by us. We were to release one Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, we gave 1,000 Arab murderers, took them out of prison and gave it back to them to release one Jew. The Arabs know it. After every war, they take prisoners, they want to exchange prisoners. For every Jew, they get hundreds of Arabs back. There's two ways to look at it. One is that the Israelis are the dumbest people in the world. Why would you give 500 uh, murderers for one soldier? Give one for one. Why you, give five, well, why you got them used to that? On the other hand, it's good for the whole world to see that one Israeli soldier worked like a thousands of them combined. That's the, the, you know, the equivalence of the value of one soldier as opposed to thousands of those terrorists filled. What value they have besides murdering people? One more thing before I start. Hashem is uh, burning Europe now. It's the highest temperature in the history of Europe since they started to measure temperatures more than a hundred years ago. There was no hot temperatures now in England, now going to France and all this, the countries around, like it was in this week. Many people died. I was in Europe a few times. It's not like here. Here, everywhere you go, you have AC. In Europe, a lot of people don't have AC. If you're lucky, they have fan. It's not like here. People live, I was in Milan, in Italy, like 110 degrees, very humid. And most places, not only there's no air condition, barely you have a fan. Not that the fan helps you when it's so humid. So I remember I did a Shabbaton in the shul in Milan, and they had a freezer room. You know those freezer room in the kitchen? That when you go in is uh, 20 below zero, something like that. Half of the Shabbat I spent inside that freezer. Not to faint, I'm not joking. I felt that every, after every lecture I have to go sit there for 10 minutes inside the freezer for 10 minutes before I faint from the heat. And now it's a lot worse than what it was there. That's why a lot of people are dying. They're not used to this kind, to handle such thing. The emergency services, they're not, uh, they're not aware what to do. Hashem is burning them. A few days ago it was in China. Over here it's also very hot, look, this week. 90 something degrees the entire week. One thing you should know, as hot as it is, is now 1% of how hot it gets in hell. You know what, I should correct myself. It's not 1,000 of a percent of the fire in hell. How do I know? The Gemara say, the Gemara say, the fire in hell is 60 times harder than the fire here. The fire here, if you burn something, let's see how long it takes the fire to burn one piece of two by four wood. You throw the wood into the fire, it takes about five minutes, no? Until the whole thing is burning. So if you do it in the fire of hell, it probably takes three seconds. The entire thing became ashes. This is just to give us an idea of how hot the fire is over there. And there's also different colors of fire. Yellow one, green one, fire that drinks, fire that eat, whatever that means. Also, I would like to remind you for those of us who become weak now, just before the Mashiach would come, for those of us who feel, uh, you know, weak, we should know 
the words of the Ramban in the introduction to the book of Job, Yov. In the book of Yov, Yov was a righteous guy. And uh, Hashem gave permission to the Satan to come and test Yov and give him hard time. But not just hard time. Basically, his life got destroyed. He was on the top of the pyramid and went to the bottom of bottoms. All his children died and he got sick and lost all his money and friends and oh, suffering like this you cannot even imagine. And Ramban, which was one of the biggest Kabbalists we ever had, he lived 750 years ago. And he has a very important book about heaven and the next world and life of eternity. It's called Sha'ar Agmul. So the Rambam in his introduction to the book of Yov, he writes over there something so scary. Oh, you can faint when you read it. He said that you should know that as bad as the suffering that Yov had to go through, you should know that 70 years of the suffering of his horrible life is not equal to one hour of the suffering in hell. So it's beyond any understanding. We complain about the heat, we complain about accident, we complain how hard the life became after COVID. Every part you need to buy for your car, they don't have. Food doesn't exist. Boats are stuck in the middle of the ocean. Restaurants do not find help. Many businesses are short on staff. Things that used to be so easy in the bank now takes you five times longer. There's a lot of burdens now. A lot of suffering in the life. But that's a joke compared to what's waiting for us when we leave this world. We complain about this. Today, I, I remember days when you had a problem in your car. Let's see, something doesn't work in a steering wheel or something. You bring the car in the morning. Before 6 p.m., you'd pick it up and complain. Why did it take so long? You say by 1 o'clock. Now it's 5 already. Remember those days, 3, 4 years ago? I put a car in the shop. A friend of mine, not a stranger, that will give his heart for me. Meaning I'm not suspecting him that he neglected my car. Let's put it that way. A stranger has priorities. Why should he take care of my lousy car when he has a $200,000 Mercedes? The job over there is 10 times more profitable. Okay. This is a, a friend of mine. He has a huge shop. Can put 20 cars in one time there. And a lot of mechanics. Two weeks to change something in a steering wheel of a Toyota Camry. Two weeks. I submitted it Tuesday two weeks ago. Today we picked it up and there was another part missing which they still didn't get. So for now it's 90% better. Next Monday hopefully we'll get the other part. Life became a nightmare. It's not just cars, everything. But in case we are being uh, annoyed, let's breathe some fresh cold air and cool off because what's waiting for us when we leave this world is at least a million times worse or more. You should know that. Don't let anyone fool you. I'm not coming here to scare anyone. I'm just coming to tell you what's written in a, bo in a book of God. You don't believe me? I'll give you the sources. I already gave you now one source. The words of the Rambam in the introduction to Book of Job. One hour in hell is worse than seven years of the suffering of Yov. Some people will be thousands of years in hell, multiplied by that one hour, which is equal to seven years of suffering. Do the math. One hour, it's seven years. 24 hours multiplied by 70. Multiply by hundreds of years. It's endless amount of suffering. We suffer two hours. Today I stood outside by the car wash. How long does it take for the car to go in and out? Probably seven minutes. I felt I'm fainting from the heat. Seven minutes. Where the car comes out, can run into the AC. 
Then I was thinking to myself, what's going to be over there? There's not going to be AC. Think about it. Auschwitz, 500 years. But a lot worse. Jews and non-Jews. Non-Jews are the idol worshippers. They also have something waiting for them. Righteous Gentiles, they got lucky. They have it the best. Only seven laws to keep, going to heaven. They have the life. Think about it. You can be a very nice, wealthy, healthy Gentile. You keep the seven laws of Noah. You don't worship any idols. You don't murder. You don't steal. You do not have intimacy crimes with your seven relatives and no homosexuality or animals or anything like that. You believe in one God and you don't eat any animal unless they are already dead before. And you have to obey the rules of the police and the court in your country. Wherever you live, Belgium, France, England, United States, China, all Gentiles are equal when it comes to those seven laws. Chinese, Arab, American, Italian, Russian, no difference. They can all marry together. They all have the same rules applies to them. And if they are righteous, they go to heaven. One of the things that many Jews don't understand now many of the Gentiles that they don't respect will be in heaven and they will be in hell. He thinks, oh, I'm a Jew, I'm important, I'm from the chosen people. Like one Jew one time told me, bottom line, Rabbi, we are the chosen people. I say, not everyone. Chosen in one condition, that you listen to your creator, not rebel against him. <laughs> Everything he told you to do, you do the opposite. You are chosen, you're the worst in the world. Any Arab is better than you. His wife don't make dress modest. He prays five times a day. Doesn't eat pork. Doesn't charge interest. <laughs> he keeps more mitzvot from the Torah than you. What makes you chosen? Some of those Arabs, if you tell them you're willing to jump now from the Empire State for the sake of Allah, something inside me, tell me, tell, something inside me tells me that at least 1% of them will jump. Let's not exaggerate, but one out of a hundred will jump. I'm thinking to myself, if I ask a hundred of my Israeli friends, will you jump from the Empire State Building for the sake of God? If Hashem asks you, jump for me. Show me how much you love me. I mean, of course, it's not going to happen and it doesn't prove anything. But if there was such a, hypothetically speaking, if there was such a test, how many of the hundreds would jump? I'll be honest with you, I'm not so sure I would jump. Anyway, I'm so scared of height <laughs> to begin with. But even people who are not afraid of height, you know, these people who go to the bungee jumping, you know, I, wow, they give me a billion dollars to jump like this with the head down a hundred yards and jump up and down. I don't know how they do it. How did I get a heart attack? It's unbelievable. Anyway, you got the point. So the point is, much easier to be a righteous Gentile. Uh, the problem is most of the Gentiles are not even aware that that's all they have to keep. They keep themselves tortured for 60, 70 years for no reason. They do things that there's no need for it. And some of the things that they torture themselves, they will be punished for. Think about it, what I just said. Think about what I just said, Arabs. Every year, they fast 40 days, Ramadan. Some of them fly to Saudi Arabia, they go to Mecca, they go to the place, the Dome of the Rock there, whatever they call it, the Rock, the Black Rock. Only Muslims are allowed. You see, by them, no lefties are complaining that they are racist and fascist. Imagine if the Jews would say, over here, only Jews are allowed, no Gentile allowed to step. You cannot filter our place. Go and say it to the world, what they are what they going to do to the Jews. The Jews would say something like this. You're not allowed to enter over here. This city is only for Jews. No Gentile is allowed to contaminate the place. It's going to be a non-stop on the nose for years. 
Generations, they were going to teach about it. They made up a lie that we killed JC, which was all a lie. 2,000 years, they continue with this lie. They made up a lie that the Jews killed the, the Christian kid and, and made matzahs with his blood. All kinds of stupid lies. But they keep going. They never come and say enough with this nonsense. Nobody anyway believes it. But they keep going. One Israeli reporter put a baseball hat. He found a moderate Muslim. He didn't tell him he's Israeli reporter. He told him he's American. His English is pretty good. And he wanted him to smuggle him into Mecca now. In the holiday that the Muslim had, Eid al or something. So he actually filmed everything inside, but it's only allowed by Muslims to go in. No one else is allowed. So when he comes with a Muslim, they look inside the police, they check you, your ID, and they let you go. He went in, he filmed the whole things, mamash, millions of them. And they give food to everyone for free. They make thousands of tents. That's tents, people sleep in tents. And they sell food morning, afternoon, and evening for thousands of people for free. Similar to the way it used to be in the time of Bet HaMikdash. Everyone who came to Jerusalem had a place to sleep, food to eat, water. In the wells, the people used to dig wells for them that they will be able to get water. Similar a little bit. Anyway, Rabotai, these Muslims, they believe in a fake religion. Nobody ever gave Muhammad anything, definitely not Angel Gabriel, like they call Jibril. The book is full of human errors. It's beyond ridiculous. By reading it once, you get the point that this is nothing divine here. Nothing here makes sense. It's complete. I don't want to say too many words because I want to leave another day. But you get the point. So they believe in this nonsense, and based on that, they torture themselves for no reason. I'll give you an example. Forty days they fast from morning to, to night. Not all of them, some of them hide and eat. I spoke to a few Arabs in Israel. So you really think I'm fasting in this heat? I go, I drink, and I come back. But I have to put the show here, otherwise people here will kill me. So they know I'm eating. Okay, not everyone is so religious, like it looks sometimes. By Jews, you also have fakers. Fakers you have everywhere. It's, not, it's nothing new under the sun. There are real people, real devoted religious people in all religions, and there are fakers everywhere. So now they're fasting for 40 days. Will they get a reward for it? Nothing. Zero reward. Perhaps they will also get punished for that, for following a fake religion. But if they won't be punished, definitely they don't have any reward for it, because who told you to fast? Jews that fast every day, they'll get a reward for it or no? If they fast on Yom Kippur, will they get a reward for it? Yes. Absolutely. Tisha Be'av, Shvaisre Betamuz, Asara Betevet, Ta'anit Esther. Just regular days if they decide to fast. All the five uh, fast plus Yom Kippur absolutely get a reward for it. If you decide to fast every week, some people love to torture themselves. Is this something Hashem wants? The answer is absolutely not. If Hashem wanted us to fast every day or every week, He would write in the Torah, the more you fast, the better it is. But the Torah say one day a year you have to torture yourself. What is that Yom Kippur? Meaning the rest of the year, eat, enjoy, rest, and get dressed nicely in the holidays, eat well in the holidays, enjoy time with your family, learn Torah, sing, come together to the synagogue, gather together with friends. The religion is not meant to torture people. A person should follow those commandments that he should live, not that he should suffer and die. Even Shabbat, which is the eternal covenant between the Jewish people and God, 
when a life of someone is in a risk, you're allowed to break Shabbat to save the life of that individual. Meaning as important as it is, someone who breaks Shabbat has a death penalty by stoning and an eternal cut for his soul in the afterlife. No joke. There's basically no worse punishment than that exists, ever. But to save a life of someone, you must break Shabbat until you save the life. Then you continue. What happens if there's a 1% chance that he'll die? He has high fever. From every 100 people that have a high fever, barely one will die. 99% tomorrow will feel better or two days. So what are the odds that this person right now that have headache and fever will die? One to a hundred, one to five hundred, one to a thousand. I don't know the exact statistic. But definitely there's a bigger chance that he would survive than die. What are the obligation? To break Shabbat. We cannot take a risk. Even one to a million. We can't take a risk. Why? Life is holy. You have to sanctify life. Hashem wants you life, not dead. Hashem wants you healthy and happy, not suffering and torture yourself from morning to night. So, they're going to fast for 40 days. There's no obligation to do so. They get nothing for it. When the women dress modest, they're going to get a reward for it? Why Muslim women dress modest? Because it's written in the Quran? Or because it's the right thing to do? What do you think? Well, to, you're right about what you say. If they're going to dress in certain countries not modest, they'll get arrested. In Iran, there is police by women. They kidnap the woman into the car. And you will see her, if you're lucky, in a week. After they're going to teach her how to change her fashion style. You know, like the, in Iran, they believe very much what they say in Israeli uh, army, what doesn't come through the head, comes through the legs. Meaning, in simple English, if you don't understand the easy way, you will understand the hard way. It means that in the Israeli army, when you get an order, Mizrahi, you see that tree on the mountain? 60 seconds go. What does it mean go? You have to run to the mountain, bring leaves from the tree, and come back to where your general is standing, back and forth within 60 seconds, and if you're late by a second, now you're gonna do it 10 times. And if you're late again and again until the morning. So what do you, if you're smart, what do you do? The first time you put your life into it, because you don't wanna mess up. If you come back by 60 seconds, he leaves you alone for the rest of the night. He found another victim. You, come here. 60 second run. So a wise guy, he comes from Tel Aviv, from the beach, surfing board, long hair. A few days later, they shave his head, giving him uniform. And what happened? He runs into the army now, in a mountain, in a desert, humid, hot, heat, running, heavy weight on the back. It's a big change of culture. Two days ago, I was in a club of Tel Aviv with a nice dress and all that. And now he runs with uniform that 5,000 soldiers wore them before. You're not getting brand new uniform. It's not America there, you know. It's the, the grandfather of Herzl was wearing those uniforms. <laughs> so he keeps going. The, and, the, and the blankets, wow. If you shake the blanket, all the people sit here now faint on a spot. Do you know how much dust? You're going to go 50 times. Each soldier hold the two sides of the blanket. Ready? Pa! Go! Cloud of dust. One, two, three. Pa! Cloud, third time, fourth, tenth, twenty, thirty, no exaggeration, thirty times, and still dust coming. It looks like the whole desert is in my blanket. This is if you're lucky. Sometimes you have an extra bonus. There's lice, little lice. They go into the blanket and they love the wool. 
and they're very dark and the, and the blanket is dark gray and the lice is black and you go at night you put the, the blanket on you wake up in the morning your entire body is itching you take off your shirt you see black dots under the skin like ticks and they walk under your skin wow you have to take it now out with the needle oh my gosh you have to see what's going on over there you have to see and this is some soldiers who had a nice pool in Herzliya Pituach, beautiful mansion, parents are rich, same story. Next day they are over there cleaning the dust that was inherited to them by other generations of soldiers. This is what's going on. So Abotai, we like to complain, but believe me, What's waiting for us for committing our sin is nothing really to compare. I started to give an example on Shabbat. If the life is in a risk, you must break Shabbat. If the guy, his, his wife is dressed modest, did they do it before Islam started? The answer is yes. Everyone in the world was dressed modest until 120 years ago. See pictures in the archive from 1900 in South Carolina Beach. Today is one of the most not maddest places in the world, that beach, Myrtle Beach. Everybody is naked there basically. Go four or five generations ago and see how women used to come to the beach with gowns, like wedding gowns. Hats, cover on the face, umbrella, everything covered. You don't see one inch of her skin in the beach. American goyot. No, I'm not talking now rabbits and from Nebrak here. What happens if they want to the, the swim? There's rooms inside the water from wood. You open the door, you go in, you take off your clothes, nobody sees you, you lock the door, but there's no floor. You walk in, you're in, you're in the water, but it's covered from all directions. You swim, you dive, or you do whatever you want. You get dry, you get dressed, open the door and come out. Goyot! Grandmothers of the Goyim of today, or grand-grandmothers, that's it. So everyone was modest, regardless of religion. It was simple dignity. People used to be people, not animals. Today everybody became an animal. Animals walk naked. People always being dressed. Animals always been naked. Mm. Now, there's no difference between people and animals. Everybody walks naked on the street. So the question is, people who still dress modest, what is the reason they're doing it? They're doing it because this is normal to do. They're going to get a reward for it. That they don't behave like animals. But if they do it because some fake religious book say it so, they're not getting the reward for it. Because they follow a fake religion. And many other examples, Rabotai. I want to give you an example of what we're talking here about. You know, in religion, there's a lot of sacrifices. When we had the temple, they used to sacrifice animals. Why animals have to be sacrificed for our sins? Where is the justice? I will commit a sin and the next day I'm going to bring some lamb into the temple and they slaughter the poor sheep and I see all the blood on the altar and this and I will repent and make a confession and see all the blood and I get so scared and they say to me, shame on you, it should have been you. But why? Okay, fine. You, you scared me enough. Next time before I committed the sin, I'll think a thousand times before. But the question is, why this poor sheep has to suffer for my sin? The Torah is very precise when it comes to judgment that everyone is fully responsible for his own sins. Even children don't die for their parents' sins or the other way around. yumat. Lo yumtu avot albanim. The Torah says, yumat. Every individual has to die for his own sin, not his friend's sins, not his father's sin, not his son's sins. That's, by the way, disqualify Christianity in one minute. 
because the idea that JC, poor JC, the suffering JC, he has a sack on his back and all Christian sinners throw all their sin on his back. JC, catch. Don't worry, son. I suffer for all of you. I took on myself to be a sacrifice. That's against the Torah. And the best part is that Christians admit that they are part two. There's part one, the Old Testament, and part two should be from the same God. How is it possible that in the first Torah I say, no, everyone must pay for his own crimes, no one else. No one can throw his sins to someone else to suffer for him or to be punished for him. Even father to son or, or vice versa. So why would a person take the sins of everybody else and release them that they continue to commit more sins as much as they want? You see right away it's a scam. So let me give you an example now. It's written in our parasha, what we read on Shabbat, Vayal par va'ail ba'misbeach. The Gemara in Masechet Nedarim, what does it mean vayal par va'ail ba'misbeach? You bring up a cow and a ram on the altar. In Masechet Nedarim, the Gemara, page 35, the Gemara says, Hani kahani, shluched idan havu, o shluched shmaya. That's in Aramic, translation. The Kohanim, the high priest that serves in a temple, they are the messengers of God, or they are the messengers of the public? Do you understand the question or no? I'll describe to you a scenario. Someone accidentally broke Shabbat. Someone told him, you know how to do it on Shabbat. Oh my God, I know, I'm sorry. Sorry or not, you have to bring a sacrifice to Bet HaMikdash to repent. For not intentional violation of Shabbat. One time, not knowing that what you just did is a sin. So now, when you come to the temple and you give your offering to the Kohen, you bring the the sheep, and he has to slaughter it. This korban chatat, the kohen that does the service, is he representing you, or is he representing God? Who nominated him to be a service, at service in the temple? The Torah. God chose the family of Aaron Kohen to service in Bet HaMikdash. But they have to service the people that come to bring sacrifices. So who they represent? They represent God? They work for God or they work for us? I'll give you an example. You have the United States court. You have the defense, public defender. He is paid by the United States government. He is an employee of the court. When someone cannot afford his own lawyer, they assign for him a public defender. Hopefully the public defender will know what's the name of the defendant and what the case is about when he arrives to court, hopefully. <laughs> Usually they really have no idea what's going on. They just collect their paycheck, they come, hi judge, I'm here. Excuse, what's the name of my client? Hold on, what's your name? Uh, what is the case? Okay, hold, hold on, let me see. I've seen it in my own eyes. I'm not telling you stories. Okay, hold on, let me see. I need two minutes, please. Now he's preparing his homework. When he's a defendant, maybe he's gonna face three, four years in prison. As he stands there in a court, two minutes before, he's trying to learn the case. Either because he's just a lazy bum and an evil person, or because he has so many cases, it's not even possible that he can represent so many people. But that's the justice today in America. So now this public defender is a representative of the public or is the representative of the government of United States? Who does he represent? Who pays his salary? The government of United States. Who does he work for? The government of United States. Who does he represent? The public. So who, are, who is he? A messenger of the government or a messenger of the people? 
a Kohen is a messenger of God or is a messenger of the people? You understand the question? Why, it's, why does it make a difference? We'll find out. So the Gemara says, the messengers of us or messengers of Shmaya, of Hashem. A, we have to understand. Why do you even have a doubt about it? We know that Gentiles also bring sacrifice in the holy temple of Jerusalem when he was there. Gentiles used to come daily and bring offerings. What kind of uh, sacrifices they go and bring? Donations. Donations. They want to donate to the temple, to the house of God. They admire the Jewish nation. They admire King David, King Solomon, all these righteous king. They admire the family of the high priest, the Kohanim. They see the miracles that happens over there every day. And they had a baby girl, and he, Ahmed wants to bring a sacrifice to thank God for Fatma. Little Fatma was born, and he wants to say thank you. Why not? Very nice of him. You allowed to accept from him? Yes. So what's the proof over here? So if the goyim are allowed to sacrifice, we have a rule. What's the rule? A Jew cannot be a messenger for a goy. You can be a messenger for one of your brothers, but you cannot be a messenger for someone from a different nation. And shlichut lenochri. Whether the Jew send the, the Gentile to service on his behalf, or whether the Gentile send the Jew on his behalf, it's invalid. There's no discrimination. It works both ways. If the Gentile wants the Jew to serve him, meaning to be his service, he cannot do it. If the Jew wants to use the Gentile to do service for him, he cannot do it. We're talking holy service. Regular favors to each other, they can do as much as they want if they're friends. We're not talking about in every day. We're talking in a temple now. I want to make you a messenger to circumcise my baby. Today we don't know how to circumcise. We bring a professional moel. The obligation is for every father to circumcise his children, his boys. Everybody used to do it. There was no such thing, moel. Every man in yeshiva, when he was young, learn how to circumcise, no big deal. Check the baby if he's yellow or not, you check certain things, you check how to do the mila, you check how to do the orla, you check what happened if, there, if it wasn't perfect, tzitzina me'akvim, tzitzin she'ena me'akvim, there's all kinds of rules. One day you learn, you know how to circumcise, technically. That's it. Today, we do not want to learn how to circumcise because we have very weak character. You see all this blood coming and your own son is screaming and your wife is fainting in the, in the ladies section and your mother is screaming and the Persian people, everybody, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't know what, what's going on. You can faint, fall on, on the baby. <laughs> You know, so what happened? Let me not have the headache. You, Rabbi, I nominate you to be the Moel Amulet Bni. If the Moel is a Goy, can he circumcise your son? No, not allowed. We just say it. For holy services, you cannot hire someone that is not from your own nation. You cannot hire him and he cannot hire you. But we know that when the Goyim came to Bet HaMikdash, they gave the sacrifices to the Kohanim to sacrifice for them. So it's a contradiction. Can the Jewish Kohanim sacrifice for the Gentiles or not? If you tell me there's no such thing, how did they do it? If you tell me there is such a thing, why are you telling me there's no shlichut legoi? You have to make up your mind. It has to work both ways. Okay. The answer, the Tosfot in Masechet Yoma, page 19, and also Masechet Kiddushin, page 23, explaining this doubt. Of course that the Kohanim are the messengers of God. Who hired them? Who nominated them? Hashem. But we have to ask ourselves a question. Besides the fact that they are actually messengers of God, can we also say that they are the messengers of us at the same time? Or no? 
or maybe they're only the messengers of God and that's it. We do not have a, a doubt if they are a messenger of God or not. We know that. The question is, we are doubting if they also can represent us at the same time. Therefore, if we're going to say the Kohanim are working for us as well, and they are also messengers of God, when a Goy comes, even though the Kohen is not representing him directly, but he represents Hashem, he accepts the sacrifice for God. Because I'm working for him as well. I'm like the mediator between you and him. So therefore, there's no difference if a Jew gives it to me and I bring it to God, or a non-Jew brings it to me. Either way, I work for him and I collect for him. Oh. But... If he was only a messenger of the public, since there is no legit way to be a messenger of someone from another nation, he would not be able to accept a donation from those goyim. Conclusion, the people, the Kohanim, that works in Bet HaMikdash, they are the servants of Hashem and also the servants of the public. So when Jews come, it doesn't really matter whether you're serving Hashem right now or you're serving the Jew, either way you accept the sacrifice. From this, on this behalf and on this behalf. If an angel brings it, you can accept it only by the power that you represent God. Also there is a verse in the Tanakh that God said to Solomon, Ki beti bet fila ikare lekol ha'amim. The temple even though it's mainly for the Jewish people, it's also a house of prayer for all the nations. What does it mean, a house of prayers for all the nation? In Sukkot, the holiday of Sukkot, who comes in a few months now, we used to sacrifice 70 cows for 70 nations. Even though today you have more than 70 nations, some nations broke into many, like the Arabs. They have like 20 countries, but it's all Ishmael. So it's one sacrifice for Ishmael. 20 countries, one and a half billion people, one sacrifice, one cow for Ishmael, one cow for each nation. 70 nations, 70 cows. 13, 12, 11, 10, every day like this, all together 70. And the eighth day, which is Shmini Atzeret, only one cow for the sake of the Jewish nation. Seventy cows for the Goyim, one for the Jewish nation. The Gemara say when the Goyim came to destroy the temple so anxiously, they only shot themselves in the leg. <laughs> we are praying for you, all the blessings that come to you for your countries and your wealth and success and everything you have. Everything God gave you has to do with the fact that we pray for you every year that you are a part of that nation and the sacrifice we make for you. You come and destroy the temple and the altar, we are unable to sacrifice for the nations. We also do not sacrifice for ourselves. But most of the sacrifices were for you, not for us. You are 99% of the people in the world. 70 cows offering were for you. One was only for us. We lost the one, you lost 70. It reminds me about the story. One person hated his, his neighbor so bad, blindly, cannot look at him. One time, Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet, came to him and said, today is your lucky day. Anything you're going to ask from me, I'm going to give you. But in one condition, whatever you ask, I give your neighbor, your enemy, double. <laughs> Imagine when he heard that end of the sentence. It started so good. Today it's your lucky day. Everything you ask, your wish is my command. But your enemy will get double. A normal person would say, give me this, give me health, give me money, give me children, whatever he needs, right? But your neighbor's gonna get double. Okay, you ask five kids. You don't have kids. Ten years, no kids. God, give me five kids. I want five kids. Three boys, two girls. Three girls, two boys. Whatever. Three and three. Give me six. 
make it equal rights. Three and three. But I'm going to give your neighbor six and six. <laughs> the heck with him. What is it my business? As much as I hate him, I care about what I get. Right or wrong? Between me and you. If someone will come to you and say, my dear poor Jew, I know how you struggle to pay your bills. This is big inflation. Struggle is not easy. I'm willing to give you now five million dollars cash in a suitcase. It's yours. But, but, I'm going to give Bernie Sanders ten million. Now I'm thinking to myself, maybe it's a bad example. <laughs> because for him, better to lose the five million. But you got the point. So yes, you will love very much that you got such a nice gift. The one you cannot stand just got doubled. No, okay, we live with that. What can I do? Who said life is perfect? So the guy said to Eliyahu and Avi, poke one of my eyes. <laughs> Make sure you poke both of his eyes. At least I can see with one. <laughs> and he won't be able to see me anymore. It's worth it. Some people willing to suffer as long as they torture their enemy with them. This is what this Goim did. Why are you coming to destroy the temple? What do you care what we do in Jerusalem? You live in Rome. You live in Italy. You have great olive oils and all kinds of minerals. And Italy is probably the prettiest country in the world. Everything you want you have. And you have your culture, and you have your language, and you have your beauty, and you have wealth, and you are now the biggest empire in the world, and people pay you taxes everywhere. What in the world goes into your mind to come from Rome all the way to Jerusalem on horses or boats in order for you to destroy the beautiful temple? What is it? Especially when this temple is used once a year to sacrifice for you, and that's one of the reasons for all your success. Doesn't make sense. We will bury ourselves as long as we drag you down with us. That's how it goes. One other uh, explanation. We have a rule in the sacrifice of Passover. Passover, who slaughter the sheep? Korban Pesach. Who has to slaughter the sheep? Huh? The answer, the owner of the group. Everyone writes a list of members. Just like today have WhatsApp groups. They also had groups. Not WhatsApp, groups of Korban Pesach. Why? It's written in the Torah, Eno nechal ela tzali, meaning it has to be barbecue not cooked, not steamed. It can only be eaten by people that came in advance to tell the owner of the goat that they want to participate in his goat. Maybe the neighbor, your uncle, your father, your friend, your, bro your brother, everyone has his own goat. So how many people can participate in one goat? 40, let's say, 50, to eat the whole goat. So he writes, Reuven, Yitzchak, Shimon, Levi, Yosef. He writes in advance, only the people that are in the list from before you slaughter can participate in that. A guest that accidentally showed up, as much as it's important to do hospitality, not in the sacrifice of Pesach. It has to be only for Limnuyav, to the members that signed that they will come to eat. Who has to slaughter that animal? The owner. Okay. So, because if the owner doesn't know how to do shechita, like today, if I want to slaughter a goat, because I want to eat the meat on Pesach, we have a lot of guests. Many people in Israel, and even here, they don't count on buying meat from stores. Too many doubts. Who knows who slaughtered it? 
Well, how the animal was. Why do I have to count on people? I have my own shochet. I go upstate New York. I say to him, here, slaughter this sheep or this cow, cut, clean the skin, everything. It takes hours. Cut for me ribs, cut for me this. It's thousands of dollars. But it doesn't have to be one family. It can be five families. Everybody gets share the meat. By the way, it's a lot cheaper than to pay $20, $30 a pound here. It's cleaner, fresher, cheaper, and definitely better as far as knowing that it's 100% kosher. Why? Because you know who slaughtered it, and you, he checked it right in front of you, and he shows you, look, the lung is clean, smooth, no holes, no defect, nothing is broken. So you see what you buy. Some people in Israel, that's the only meat they do. They have a huge freezer. They stack it for three, four months. And every Shabbat, they take out ribs, this, that. That's what they do. Here in America also. So when they slaughter, if you don't know how to do it, you bring a coin to slaughter for you. Coin, please. I make you a shaliach, a member, to slaughter the animal for me for Korban Pesach. <laughs> So other sacrifices, the owner of the sacrifice has to slaughter it or anyone can slaughter it? Anyone. Doesn't have to be the owner. Only in Korban Pesach it has to be the owner. Meaning in other sacrifices, doesn't have to be the owner. So when a guy comes, he cannot do shechita. He gives it to the Kohen, the Kohen can do it. Anyone can do it, even someone else, not the Kohen. Right? Shechita kshira bizar. So, when a goy makes a neder, a vow, to donate to the temple, and the Kohen sacrifices it for him, even though he's not his messenger, he can definitely slaughter for him, just like everyone else, that is not a Kohen. Right? And therefore, we have no problem accepting donations from the goyim whatsoever. You see, from here you get a lesson that uh, we do not make decisions based on feelings and trying to be politically correct. Based on the, w and the, on the vibes in the street. That's not how it works. We only stick to the rules of the divine book. Whatever God said to do, we do. Sometimes we love very much what he told us to do. Sometimes it's not so sweet in our mouth. Some people, they're not, not every mitzvah you are equally attracted to. Some mitzvah, for instance, some people on Passover, it's mitzvah to eat lamb. Lamb ribs, shish kebab, delicious. Who, who doesn't like such a mitzvah? You go to the restaurant, little, little ribs, 50 bucks. Little tiny, one bite, five, six bites, 50 bucks. Now you have all night, you eat, you enjoy, wine, why not? So it's a great mitzvah. <laughs> who wouldn't want it? Anyone who likes meat, enjoy the mitzvah. But some mitzvot, oh, 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 there's so much headache. Let's see you going from Tiberias to Jerusalem to sacrifice a, a sheep. It takes you two weeks to get there with your donkey. And two weeks to come back in the heat, like today. In Israel, it's hot like this every day. You see the heat outside today? Every day is like this for six months straight. From June, actually even before May, it begins to be very hot, but June, July, August, and September, like this. Very humid, Tel Aviv, sauna. You take a cold, freezing shower. Freezing. You don't touch the hot water. You're shaking. You come out of the shower room. One minute in the living room or in your bedroom, you need to take the towel again and dry again. Okay, you dry, you're about to get dressed, you're wet again. You dry yourself again, you're about to get dressed, you're wet again. What's the point of taking a shower? There's no way to dry. But I'll tell you something even better than that. In Israel, if you dry yourself with a towel, towel, and you want to hang the towel to dry, in the closet, let's say, you don't want to throw it right away to the laundry after one shower. So you want to dry it, maybe I'll use it tomorrow also. Two or three showers, I'll change the towel. Here, 
if you come after five hours, it's totally dry. Dry smells good, it still smells the laundry on it, the detergent. In Israel, it never gets dry. Two weeks, it's still wet because of the humidity. In Tel Aviv, I was going crazy. So what's going on with this towel? It's 110 degrees outside, sunny, so hot. This towel is already five days hanging here and it's not getting dry. Still smells wet and feels wet. Why? Humidity. No, well, I don't know. Some places is even worse. I was in Panama, oh my gosh. Costa Rica, Panama, China. Ooh, you live in a sauna. Free sauna. Free. Top. I always wonder why Hashem made some places dry and some places extra humid. Humidity creates clouds. The humidity goes up, evaporates, creates the clouds, clouds explode and bring rain. Rain makes the fruit and vegetables grow. That's why you make a lot of money. So you sweat, but it brings you lots of cash. If you're in a desert, it's very dry, but there's no income. <laughs> what are you going to do? Make a cheese out of the camel milk. Sell leathers of the animals. Things like that. What are you going to do in a desert? How much money you can make? Every place with his advantages. Now, Rabotai, we have to learn a very important principle. We can divide the world to two different groups. Student of Abraham. Remember, Abraham is the father of almost all the people in the world. Jews, Arabs, Europeans, Chinese. Almost everybody. Europeans, they all came from whom? Esav. Yefet, family of Abraham. And uh, the people that went to the East, Chinese and others, Thailandi, Japanese, all these people, Philippines, they're all the children of Abraham from the next wife he took. He had first Hagar, and Hagar gave him a lovely boy named Ishmael. Ismail in Arabic. So Ishmael was born first. When he was 13, Yitzchak was born from Sarah. So you have a son, Ishmael, 13, now a brand new baby, Yitzchak. Few years later, Abraham takes another woman. Her name is Ketura. And he has kids from Ketura and he sends them to the east and he gives them gifts. What are the gifts? Black magic. Black magic. In the uh, East, you have in India, in uh, China, all these places, they have all kinds of skills of making all kinds of kishufim. I remember I had a chavruta in yeshiva, it was in India. He told me, if I will tell you that I went to India and I saw something over there that you won't believe it. Can you believe it? I'll tell you what happened. I went to India. I see a group of people around something. I come to see. I see a statue is sitting in the middle and one Indian magician has a yogurt, like this, a jar of yogurt with a spoon. He takes the spoon, he puts it in the mouth of this statue, and the statue drinks it. And everybody falls and bow down. You see, when you go to those places in India, Tibet, Thailand, all these places of Kishufim, of idol worshipping, I should say, they make the entrance to the temple very low. Very, very low. So the only way to enter is to bow down, walk a few steps, and rise. By the time you rise, you see a huge statue, pure gold, 
millions of dollars. How much they waste on this shtuyot, this nonsense. You just found yourself bowing down to their fake god of these Indians or Hindus or Buddhists and all these kinds of cults. So what does the Israeli do? What do they do when they go? They enter in reverse. <laughs> they bow down to the opposite side and they walk in reverse. They get angry, but Jews, after all, as wicked as they are, a righteous Jew, what does he have to do in India in idol-worshipping places? The fact that he goes there already doesn't show that he's such a tzaddik. Yes, but even a rasha like this doesn't bow down to an idol. He's mechalel Shabbat, he's eating trefot, he has Christina, his girlfriend, he's cheating the customers in the business from morning to night. He never put fill in for 20 years. He doesn't know anything from his left and right, full of tattoos. He has a horse tail in his back, meaning ponytail. Earring over ear, earring in his toes, 15 earrings on his ear. A real creature. But when he enters the place to see the beauty of the place, he enters in reverse. I'm not going to bow down. It's a command. What's the difference between you and Mr. Idi Amin? Whatever his name, Gindi, Gandhi. The Indian guy. He bowed down to the cow, you bow down to your nonsense. What's the difference? None of you serve the real God. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying I'm a tzaddik, but I'm not going to bow down to this idol. No matter what, you, you burn him. You torture him. I don't, I'm not mishtachave. I once had a big schut, באמת, big schut, one of my biggest achievements ever in 27 years of work in Kirov, to make a Baal Tshuva, but a very special one. One of the most dangerous gangster in the history of Israel, a real dangerous criminal, that every week the magazine of the crime in Israel, he was in the front page. Every week, for years, he's like, uh, <laughs> you just look at him, you freeze. Full of scars, muscles, voice that frees your blood. He gives you a look, believe me, you don't, not, you don't need to know him. You already know that your life is in a risk. To the point that when, uh, when I got to know him, he started to come to my lectures in Brooklyn. One time he told me, Next time you come here, you don't need to look for parking. It was in King's Highway, and it was Avenue J and East 14, around that area. He said to me, you don't need to find parking. Just put a note on the windshield with my name. No one will dare to give you a ticket. I started to laugh. <laughs> I was laughing, thinking it's a joke. And one guy came to me, grabbed my sleeve. Why are you laughing? What are you He's serious. Try it. No one will come near your car. I said, ma, the goyim that give tickets in over here by the meters and he's 14, they know, they know him. So everybody here knows him. Then one guy told me that one time he had a girlfriend and he wanted to buy her uh, some necklace or bracelet. He came to Manhattan. He walked into a store that owned by a Korean guy. And he came with all his muscles and his scary voice. And he said, how much is this? The guy said, for you, you can take, take, <laughs> like this, a gift. How much I want to pay? Gift, gift. <laughs> Just take it and go before he's gonna pull a gun. Or you don't need to know who he is, I'm telling you. One time he came to visit me in Sukkot. I used to live in an ultra-ultra-ultra-ultra-orthodox ultra, ultra, Hasidish neighborhood. All the kids shaved their head, big, big peot, all speak Yiddish. When he showed up, all <laughs> the Hasidish kids, they were all hiding. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, they follow. <laughs> they, never, they never saw in their life a goy. Ever, because it's all, they're only in Yiddish. They go to yeshiva, come home. It's like a Jewish ghetto there. They don't see anyone. 
They don't go anywhere. They don't go to supermarket. They don't go to Manhattan. They're there. All of a sudden, they see someone like this. He comes with sleevelets, comes like this with sunglasses. <laughs> he sits in my sukkah, the whole line. Everybody has his porch, the deck, one parallel to the other. <laughs> Everybody was looking like, everyone was shaking until he leaves. Who is this guy? But he became such a tzaddik. Ooh, ah. he apparently was a Levi also. Grandson of Moshe Rabbeinu. Why did I remember him now? Because one time they robbed a big boat full of generators. Thousands of big generators. Everyone, 3,000, 5,000 out, but thousands. A bunch of robbers, they come with machine guns. They kidnap the boat. As they kidnap the boat and they're trying to take the boat to a different place to sell these generators, the Interpol, FBI, Interpol, helicopters, attacking them from all over, they arrested them. They put them in jail in Italy. He told me, I was the only Jew over there. 6 a.m., everybody stands like this. They have this Maria idol and JC. Everybody comes in the morning. They force you to say a prayer over there, to bow down. I was the only one who didn't pray, bow down. Everybody there is going. They bow down. Bow down. No. Oh. <laughs> he said, you know what they did to me? They were beating me up, making up lies about me, forcing me, closing me in a room for a week, alone in a room, nobody there, put a little mosquito over there to drive you crazy for a week. No bathroom. You have to do the bathroom next to your things where you sleep. I don't have to tell you the conditions over there. Two years. Now once I agree to bow down. I say, okay, now I understand why we now have the schut to, to become Baal Tshuva. He left the crime, finished with everything, and from then on started to come to the synagogue right here in Brooklyn, 5 a.m. He was in a shul, they gave him Aliyat Levi. Until today, it's been more than 20 years, he's still religious. It wasn't just a gimmick. He stayed religious until today. Now he's close to probably 75 years old by now. Somebody like this can become fully religious. Who over here has any difficulty to be righteous? If you tell me half of the stories he told me what he, he was going through in his career, you cannot believe that things like this exist. Anyway, Rabotai, so there are two groups of people, the students of Abraham and the student of Bilam. Bilam is full of arrogance, ego, greed, dishonest, basically everything negative you have in him. Manipulator, knowing there is a God, knowing what God loves and hates, knowing what's right and wrong, and live the opposite of what God's commanded every one of us to do. Knowing his creator, and rebelling against him every day for selfish reasons. Desire, greed. Then you have on the other side, Abraham. Hashem giving him the hardest test, 10 impossible tests to imagine. He passed all of them. He never thought one thought against what Hashem promised him and now supposedly he's not keeping his promise. Not only he didn't ask, he didn't even think. Willing to die any given moment for Hashem. Never lied. Was the number one in hospitality. Sponsoring all the guests that come just to talk to them about God. That they should bless God for the food. He doesn't want any gifts. Does, he doesn't have any greed. doesn't have any jealousy. A real servant of God. Some people belong to this leader and some people belong to that leader. What do you think? Most of the people here in America, which class they visited in college? The class of Avraham Avinu or the class of Bilam? Let's be fair. For every thousand people you meet in Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, Long Island, anywhere you want, how many of them represent Bilam? 
and how many of them represent Abraham. Who knows what was the highest skill of Abraham from hundreds of great skills that he had. The Torah complement him. What was his number one achievement? Teacher. I'll tell you the verse. Ve'et ha'nefesh asher asu becharan. The souls that Abraham and his wife Sarah created in the city of Haran belongs to them. They are like their children. Who is those souls? All these Gentiles who were idol worshippers and Abraham taught them about God and about the real one God and about the purpose of life. And that's why they call him Abraham Ivri, the Hebrew. Hebrew means one-sided. Language Ivrit, Hebrew, comes from the word Ivri. Ivri means ever. One side. He was on one side of the world and everybody was on the opposite side. But slowly, slowly, more and more of these Reshaim moved to the positive side. By now he has an army of students who taught them about God and they followed the one God. Stop worship the stupid idols. That's why all three religions admire Abraham. Even Islam and Christianity admire him. But even the Buddhists and the Hindus and all of them, they also came from Avraham, from the children that he had with Ketura, and he gave them the Kishufim, and he sent them to the East. So the large portion of the world are children of Abraham. But how many of them behave like Abraham? How many? From every thousand people, how many you would say? Give a guess. You have a thousand people now standing in line in Flatbush. How many of them represent Abraham more than they represent Bilam? Let's do it together. Most people are greedy or not. Almost everyone is greedy. Some more, some less. Greed. One, they want. <laughs> they have a million, they want three. They have three, they want six. They have six, they want 20. They have a billion, they want five. He just made his first billion. Tomorrow he listens on the news that this mask in one, in one hour made 20 billion dollars. By these wealthy people, sometimes in one day they can go up 10 or 20 billion dollars up and down. Think about it. 20 billion dollars to lose or gain in one day. What 100,000 people who work all their life do not do together in 30, 40 years of hard work, he lose sometimes in a minute in a stock market. In a minute. He eats his eye, he calls his wife, hey Janet, something is in my eye, check over here. Oh, you don't have anything, don't worry. By the time the conversation is over, his stocks went up seven billion. How many years do we have to work to make seven billions, all of us? Huh? This guy make 40, this guy 60, this guy 100, this guy 200, this guy half a million. Woo, half a million. Combine all of them. Multiply by 40, 50 years of career. Everything together, once he had a little air fell into his eye and his wife went, seven billion. Huh? <laughs> ah, think about it. Magic. How stressful life like this can be. I remember once I had a Georgian student who had an office of day trading. You know what's day trading? Every few seconds they buy and sell. I don't know. If to me it looks pure gambling. Because stocks can go up and down. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the next minute. So you buy, it can go up. You can go down. You sell, it can go up. You buy, it goes down. It can be the opposite. It's pure gambling, like throwing dice. He had a partner, a Russian Jew, not religious, that this guy is frozen than Antarctica. Uh, um, do you ever see a person with no feelings? Doesn't have a heart in his body. He sits in front of the computer. This was 15, 16 years ago. As we speak and he laughs, he looks at the screen and I see in five minutes his stocks went down $300,000 in five minutes doesn't even affect him a bit. Continue the conversation, smiling. 
I asked the other guy, the Georgian, you know, they have hot blood. This Russian guy is Siberia. But the Georgian <laughs> is hot blood. I asked him, listen, this guy just lost $300,000. didn't make a beep. From your eyes, like this, his eyes. He make a million, you don't see. He lose a million, you don't see anything by him. Nothing. Full control, full discipline. Not because you have such big emuna in Hashem. Whatever Hashem wants, I'm your vessel. Use me. No. <laughs> Perhaps doesn't even believe in God. Not religious, Russian, communist, whatever. Ice. Between you and me, if your stock goes down $2,000 in the last five minutes, what happened to you? If you had a thousand gray hairs on your head, you just got some friends. <laughs> it's now 1,500. You don't believe me? I'll tell you a story. It's been a long time since I told you a story. I have a cousin, Tzaddik Yesod Olam. In Midot, impossible to find someone that have a better heart and discipline and behaving like this tzaddik. An angel. So honest. So God-fearing. So humble. You give him a little compliment, he's shy for an hour, red like a tomato. You see from his body language what a mensch, what an angel this guy is. Before he became religious, he was a general in the army, the head of like a hundred tanks. It's also very intelligent. So he's a general in the army, in the Lebanon war, with Ariel Sharon in Lebanon, 30 something years ago. After he finished with the army, he had a friend, they opened an agency to sell electronic wholesale. Stereo systems, stereo, party phone, records, back then you didn't have CDs. So it was records, you know, party phone and all kinds of uh, amplifiers and uh, speakers. He had a place in, uh, in Tel Aviv, nice big place, doubled in this beautiful synagogue, double on the side, full of electronic on the shelves. One time I came to visit him, I said, oh, wow, in such a short period of time, you have such a nice business, bli Nara. Then, he already had a car, his partner had a car, the business had a car. They grow pretty fast. Who are most of their clients? Arabs. Arabs from the Palestinian areas, they buy stereos and sell from them, they all sell. Intifada started, they closed the border, no Arabs coming in and out. Arabs owe him millions of shekel. You know, he gives them merchandise, they have to pay. There's nobody to reach. They don't answer the phone, they know they got away with the money. <laughs> How is he gonna come to here? They close the, area, the, the gate. Two, three months, nobody paid him. He went bankrupt. I saw him with full black hair and 30 days, 30 days later I saw him for the second time, full white hair. Everything became white in one month. I told him, Ofer, what happened to you? He said from Meatzarot, um, I owe millions of shekels to suppliers, to people, to the bank, to the government. They're knocking on my door. They went to my parents. You know, Israel is Gestapo. It's not like here. You owe money, they don't pay the bank. They come, boom, they knock on your door. Otsala poal, open the door. They take your laundry machine. They take your table and chairs. It's not like here. Hi, is it okay if we come tomorrow at four o'clock? Maybe you can give us some money that you owe the bank. I'm busy, call next year. Okay, okay, we're sorry, we didn't want to offend you. <laughs> Israel is Israel, you know? And if you resist, they're gonna break your glasses in your face. <laughs> You're not gonna be able to say anything. Hi, you have a debt. You owe 50,000 shekel to the bank. We came to repossess your property. No, no, give me another day, I'm sorry. I'm only doing my job, move. Taking, taking everything. everything. 
TV, everything. You know, the Israelis here laughing, but they know what I'm talking about. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, in one hand it's terrible, on the other hand it's good. At least the crooks know <laughs> they're not going to get away with that like they do here. Change the corporation. Rabbi, I'm not XYZ Corp anymore. You're not updated. I'm ABC Inc. Oh, yeah? Well, you just opened the corporation two months ago. You don't know the deal. I open a corporation, I buy half a million dollar merchandise, the corporation <laughs> closes, I open a new one. I take half a million, I close, I open another one, like this, every three months. That's how I make my money. You really think I have customers? <laughs> that reminds me of a guy who is looking for a shidduch. Looking for a nice, lovely girl. Rabbi, I'm 25, I want to get a nice shidduch. Baruch Hashem, I heard you say in your lecture, first thing you check by a shidduch is what? Metziat chen. You like how she looks. Then you check everything else. You don't like how she looks, or she doesn't like how you look. Well, there's no connection here for shidduch. Maybe roommates, but not shidduch. Anyway, so the rabbi said, you know what? Go to this office, they have shatchanut service. Here is the address, go. He comes to the office, he opens the door, he sees a receptionist sitting by the desk. Hi, can I help you? I came for Shiduch. Say, so, okay, can you fill up the application? After he fill up the application, she looks at it, she say, would you like an American girl or an Israeli girl? American girl. Go through the green door. Israeli is the white door, American is this green door. Top. He opened the green door, he see a receptionist, another room. Hi, I'm here for Shidduch. Yeah, that's the American section. You like from age 20 to 30 or from 30 to 40? 20 to 30. Open, enter the red door. The yellow door is from 30 to 40. He entered that door, he see another receptionist. He said, hi, would you like white skin or black skin? I'm, I'm white, I want white. Okay, oh, enter that purple door. He entered that purple door, he found himself on the street. <laughs> Cops, <laughs> what is going on? Why, <laughs> he's fuming now. After all these applications going for what? He goes around, he comes to the first reception, excuse me, what's going on here? You're wasting people's time. Sir, don't get upset. To tell you the truth, we don't really have any girls, any shiduchim. But how is the service? <laughs> the service was great, no? <laughs> That's America. Oh, yeah, great service, but get the job done. <laughs> you call eight times to the customer service. You're very nice, you're polite, you're professional. You are, you're speaking beautiful, you're not getting angry. Wow, Mamash, you are the students of Avraham Avinu. But why can't you just get the job done? <laughs> We're very sorry, sir. I promise you next month the problem will not happen again. <laughs> Fifteen months like this. They can fix the tiny problem in a computer. Fifteen months. Every month. What? Unbelievable. So you have the student of Avraham Avinu and the student of Bilam. Now I know what you're thinking. Student of Bilam, I detect them from a mile. How? I'll tell you how. Guy with a ponytail, ripped jeans, nafas in his head, you know. Rabbi, have some, it's good stuff. That's the student of Bilam. See, some black hat, beard, glasses, Gemara, black and white, white shirt, tzitziot outside, going like this, sitting, Gemara, oi, 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 oi. Ah, student of Avraham, for sure. I have to be a genius to know. Avraham, Bilam, Avraham, Bilam. Let me stand on Flatbush. I'll tell you, Avraham, Bilam, Avraham, Bilam. Okay, so Bilam, you already know. You saw a lot of uh, secular people. You know, they're not exactly the children of Avraham in their behaving. But all the black hats that you now put in a, in a section of Avraham, let's begin to analyze them. And you're going to find that 99% of them are also belong to the other side. That's the mistake of most people, that they think if someone sits in yeshiva with the Gemara, it's for sure mitalmidav shel Avraham Avinu. 
If you think I'm an, an extremist, it wasn't my idea. Let me read, it, let me read to you the source. The Roli Ravleib Chasman Zatzal, he writes in his book Or Yahel, many people think that the students of Bilam Arasha is people that look dirty, criminal, cursed, all day going out, enjoying the fake world. And the students of Avraham sitting in yeshivas all day, going like this with the stander and the gemara. And the truth is, Rav Leif Hasman say, that's a mistake. Because two people can sit in yeshiva and learn one page of gemara, same Rashi, same Tosfot, same page, same everything. And they look alike, and they dress alike. And in a very holy yeshiva, and it's impossible really to see a difference between them. But one of them is a student of Abraham and the other one is a student of Bilam. How can it be? How can it be? One example is people that flatter and people that are jealous. You don't see it from the outside. Sometimes you come to speak to someone about someone else. You come to speak about someone, as soon as he hears that you compliment someone else, what does he do? Begin to attack him brutally. Ah, you don't know him. It's not what he looks. Believe me, I know him. Stop. I call lies. He cannot stand that someone else is being complimented now. It kills him. Jealousy is killing him. It can be two rabbis. One is good and the other one is a little better. If someone will compliment the better one in front of the first one, oh, 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 he will hate you for the rest of his life. Tomorrow when you're going to want to get accepted to his yeshiva, he's going to find you excuses that right? the yeshiva is not good for you. There's only one reason he hates you, because you complimented someone that he's jealous with. He can learn 20 years Torah and still stay the same rotten person person can be religious 20 years and he's the same rotten person. Same anger, same laziness, same jealousy, same desire for food, same desire for women, same desire for laziness, same desire and greed for money. Everything is the same. And I'll tell you more than that. I've seen people that when they were secular, they were better people than when they became religious. After they became religious, they were nastier arrogant, more proud, putting people down, thinking they own the world. When they were secular, they knew they don't know anything. So their ego didn't come out so bad. Now when they think, oh, I'm 20 years in yeshiva, I know a lot. Who's going to tell me where to sit and what to do? Now, 20 years later, Hashem hates him more. Why? It's an animal. I'll give you one example. <laughs> Some yeshivas, I don't, I'm not giving names, and I, I promise you I don't have any person in my mind. I'm speaking generally. Not that I'm thinking about someone. It's just from what I hear every year. But it's a general phenomena. Every year in Israel, you have hundreds of Sephardi girls who do not get accepted to yeshivas just because their parents were born in the Middle East. They were born in Russia, or Germany, or Poland, or Ukraine, or one of those countries. They would get accepted. Because their last name is a European last name. But now, because they have a Persian, or Moroccan, or Yemenite, or Syrian last name, or Egyptian, they will give them many, many excuses, and they won't accept them, and they left with no school. And it's great girls, very religious, nice, classy, from families of Torah. Now we're not talking criminal girls that are off the derech all day in the internet, in Instagram. We're not talking this kind of girls that wants to get accepted to a good yeshiva for girls. Girls like this, regardless where they're from, they are danger for the rest of the girls. We're talking clean girls, modest, watching their eyes, good ideology, tailing, davening, modesty, great family, a call perfect. We already have enough Sfaradi girls in the yeshiva. 
We are allowed up to 10%. It's like Sephardi is like some dogs with leprosy. We, you have too many of them over here. I want to ask you a question. Let's try to think like Hashem. Hashem has many children, some of them born in this country and here and here. He spread us all the nation. The reason we're born here and he's born there and she's born there, it's all Hashem. He decides where your parents are going to end and where you're going to be born. <laughs> A call from Hashem. Nobody, uh, nobody doubt that all Jews are children of Hashem, whether they're born here or they're born in a different country. It's all one family, belongs to one God. When someone European, or the other way around, it can work the other way around. Sometimes it could be as far as they discriminate Ashkenazim. That's also I heard about that. Not as much, but I heard. He doesn't accept a girl because her only crime is that her parents came from a specific country and a different culture a little bit than him. She follows the same Torah, she reads the same Tehillim, she loves in the same Tfilot, she believes in the same Ashkafa, a call is perfect. Sometimes she's even greater than all the other students he has. And he doesn't let her come to school and she sits for months at home crying from morning to night feeling terrible, she cannot show her face in the street because she wasn't accepted to any yeshiva. And someone like that person thinking is a tzaddik, this racist. He thinks I'm such a tzaddik. Tzaddik? There is no room for him in hell for someone like this. No room. They need a special section for him. He's a mass murderer. Hundreds of girls over the years he murdered because of his Nazi fascist ideology. That's how the Nazis used to dis separate between people. So many other racist people in the world separating between people based on where they came from. Generalizing. Don't hate this country, so I hate all of them. They should all die. They should all go to hell. Why? Because one or two gave you hard time. You want to now throw 100,000 people to the ground. Like Haman. Mordechai got Haman angry, everybody else bowed down to him. All the Jews bowed down to this dog. Walks in the street with his ego, every religious Jew bowed down to this dog. A former barber, who the king of Hashverosh gave him a nice position. So now he walks around and everybody scared of him and bowed down to him. One Jew refused to bow down. You have a problem with him? Go kill him. Why you want to kill everyone now? Ah, he dare not to bow down to me. I'm going to sign. All Jews must die within a year. Nazi. That's Nazi ideology. So, Rabotai, someone that sees this Hashuv manager of the yeshiva, how much respect he gets everywhere he goes. Menahel, Menahel. Hashem is preparing for him such a Gehenna in his dreams. He doesn't know where he's going to end. What do you think? Hashem is going to forgive all these souls you murdered? One soul. You have to sweat sometimes years to fix one comment. One. One comment. I told you once the story about one Melamed that told a, a, a boy I'm surprised you can enter the door. The kid became very fat. He ate a lot, he became very fat. Between one year to another, he gained so much weight. So when he walked into the door, he was late by a minute or two, and the, the teacher was angry that he's late. So in front of the whole class, he said to him, why are you late? I didn't hear the, the, the bell. I'm surprised you can still enter the door with your size. He told him. And that was like a knife to the heart of this kid. Eighth grade. After that, he became so depressed. They finished the eighth grade. Everybody went to the different yeshiva. And this kid did not want to go to yeshiva. Depressed for years. Everyone got married. He never got married. Why? That's it. He doesn't want to live anymore. Everyone laugh, you know how kids sometimes are silly, they laugh instead of screaming, hey, Lashonara, everyone laugh. Oh, the Rebbe made fun of this guy. <laughs> After years, this Rebbe that found one, one of his students from that class on the street, hi, how you been? Oh, Hashem, I'm married, I have kids, I'm learning here, I'm learning there. 
What's with Itzik? He learns here. What's with Shmuel? He learns there. What's with Menachem? He's there. What's with him? He went to business with his father. He went to all the people in the class. What's with this guy, Eli? Ah, Eli, it's a sad story. He never did anything with his life, unfortunately. Why? <coughs> he was very depressed for years. He's living in some room, depressed. Did not get married, doesn't learn, doesn't work, nothing. <sighs> Why? I'm, I'm afraid to say, Rabbi, but it's probably your fault. What? Remember you insulted him when he was in class and this? From that moment, it was the breaking point for him. I don't want to hear anything from religion, people, nothing. Oh, Ivey, that's the reason he got scared, but real scared, because he wasn't weak at this Rebbe. It was a moment of stupidity. We all have those moments. Moment of stupidity that he made a comment, he didn't even dream how bad it became. Where is it? Give me his address. He ran to his room, knock on the door. What are you doing here? I came to apologize. I'm begging you. Wow, I cannot believe what I've done to you. Give me a, a chance to fix it. You want to fix it? I give you a chance to fix it. Get the 30 students that sat there in one, in that room that day. Make sure they all come back to the same class, sit in the same place. And I will walk in the door and you will apologize to me in front of everyone for that moment that destroyed my life. And after you do that, I will forgive you. He said to the boy, it's not realistic. One lives in America, one lives in England, one lives in the north, one lives in the south. Where will I find all of them and bring them all into the class? I have to buy them uh, airfare. It's your problem, not mine. Next time you think before you make a comment and insult a person in public. This Rebbe went to Rav Eliashiv, the most important Chacham on earth. Until a few years ago he was alive. He was the general rabbi. Rav Eliashiv, I have a big problem. I actually murder a soul. Not intentionally, I never dreamed that it's gonna turn so bad. But that's the story. Now the boy is demanding a very cruel request. I'm gonna gather all the kids and it cost me, I calculated, it's gonna be $17,000 to get everything, everyone back into that class. I have to buy airfare to one guy and pay him for a for few days of, uh, off from work, from America, fly him to Israel. The next one, one wants to come with his wife, he doesn't agree to come by himself. I calculated, it's gonna cost me roughly $17,000. That's more than I make in a year. I work from morning to night, standing all day in a class teaching Torah. A year I don't make that in Israel. Do I have an obligation to burn a year of my life to repent for that one comment that I made? That I heard that sensitive voice so bad, which I never dreamed that it's obviously if I knew it's gonna be like this, I would never dare to speak. Rav Eliashiv asked him, I'm surprised you even came to ask me this question. What do you think is the answer? Of course you have to. You don't learn Gemara every day. Amalbin Fnei Chavero Barabim En Lo Chelek LaOlam Aba Someone that insults his friend in public lost his share to the world to come. You willing to take that risk? All your life, 50 years, you teach Torah and in the end you're going to come to your court case when you leave the world and Hashem say, I'm sorry, you cannot enter your place in heaven. So what's going to be with me? You have to be reincarnated again. And you're going to have to meet that soul that you insulted and destroyed their life. And after that, you will make it up to him and you suffer and you're going to go through a whole lifetime just for that one minute insult. And maybe then you go to heaven. But until then, you have no shelter to the world to come. It's suspended. You have a license, but it's on hold. Suspended license. You can't drive. Do you drive, you go to jail. Well, but I'm a great driver. Big deal, I speed a little bit in Ocean Parkway. 
Instead of 25, I drove 36. So I got a lot of tickets. Uh, suspended my license. No big deal. Well, I know how to drive. Come on, for driving 35, you, you want to give me suspension? That's the law. You can't drive. You drive, you go to jail. Nobody care. No judge would care that you're a driver for 40 years and you never had one ex accident. Nobody care. Nobody care if you prove to the judge that you drive better than a million people in Brooklyn. You broke the law. You go to jail. You can be a kosher Jew, a big righteous Jew. In one moment, you can lose everything. One moment of stupidity or wicked comment and you just put everything on hold, suspended, until you fix it. Rav Yashif told him, you have no choice. You have to bring the whole class. $17,000 to fix one minute. One minute. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi push the calf, a baby cow, came to put the head under his dress because they were taking that calf to slaughter him in a slaughtering home. And Rabbi pushed him, go. Why? Because you, you were made to be slaughtered. We have to eat meat. Yom Tov coming, Shabbat. Did he say something that is not true? We all eat meat almost. I know some of you may think, no, no, I'm a vegetarian. I don't eat meat. I don't eat dead, dead bodies. One person wrote me an, uh, an email. I don't have this habit of eating someone that was killed by someone else. I don't eat bodies, meaning I'm a vegetarian. He wrote it with such a pride. He's such a noble tzaddik, but he's the dumbest person on earth. How come? Why is he vegetarian, based on his email? Because he has mercy on the animals. He can't stand the fact that they take a big knife and slaughter a cow and rivers of blood coming out of the neck. And the cow reflex move for a minute or two after. And in the end, they take off the skin, take off the head, cut all the dirt, clean the stomach, wash everything, put salt. And later you buy it for $20 a pound right here in Ocean Parkway, I don't know, Kings Highway, whatever. He can't stand that. It's barbaric. Religious people. Oh, Rabbi, it's awful. You guys are still living in the old era, you know? Why don't you eat meat? I have mercy on animals. Ah, so you are more righteous than God himself. The one who created the animal and, ro and warned us in the Torah never to be cruel to them, never to torture them, never to starve them. And there's a list of restrictions, what you're not allowed to do to animals. And he told us, if you want to eat that cow or that sheep, this is the way it's permitted to kill the animal. Make sure the knife is very smooth. Make sure it's fast. Why? Because it's going to be an installment, the animal will suffer. If the knife is not smooth, the animal would suffer. You make sure you check the knife carefully. The animal does not feel even one second of pain. Not one second even. <coughs> one, if I give you a big punch by surprise, you're going to have about three or four seconds of sharp pain until you faint, right? Until you fall and faint. But the, the, the punch was very painful, or a smack, very painful. The animal didn't even feel that smack, nothing. Because as soon as you cut the arteries in the front, the nerve system, the, the, the connection between the brain and the nerve system immediately get disconnected. The fact that the cow has all kinds of reflex and jumping and moving, that's because the message was already sent from the brain through the nerve system to move the ligaments and the muscles and the bodies. The signal was sent before the slaughtering, so it's already traveling in the body. It still it makes all kinds of reflex, but it doesn't mean she's alive. It's dead already completely. And there's no pain whatsoever. And now you eat it. Rabbi, that did not have mercy on a calf. A little calf. It's not my son. It's not a baby in yeshiva that I have to have mercy on. It's an animal, stranger. It's, I don't own it. I have to have mercy on every animal in the world. 
But the fact he pushed it like this, with no mercy, what was his punishment? 13 years of horrible suffering and pain, stones in his kidneys, and there was no laser. Come tomorrow, we'll break it. Do you know the pain that someone has? Sometimes they have kid stone size of a plum or a big olive. They have to break it with a laser until they break it. Do you know the pain that people have in the kidneys? You have to see how they scream from the pain. For 13 years he suffers from morning to night, on and off every day. He told his servants, when you begin to hear me scream from the pain, which I can't take the pain anymore, throw food to the horses, that they make a lot of noise. Horses, when they see food, it's even worse than us. When we see food in a wedding, you see what happens? It's like a magnet. As <coughs> soon as they bring the food out, shh, the food has magnetic abilities to suck all the people into one side of the place. So horses have similar thing. As soon as they see the straw, those big boxes of straws, they throw them in. Ah, they all come from all over. It makes a lot of noise. Nobody can hear my screaming. I don't want to upset my student outside the door. That the rabbi is screaming from pain. How many years? 13 years of hell for five seconds of a tiny sin. Now imagine what's waiting for us. Do the math. I wish so that... Ah, I have, I have a question for you. You're very clever, Baruch Hashem. What do you think? That Rebbe did not do tshuva every day for 13 years? He didn't do confession after Shmona Yisrei? Hashem, no, but God, no. Believe me, his heart had hundreds of holes from his banging on his, on his uh, chest. He pray better than us, for sure. Learn Torah better than us, for sure. Thanks to him, we have Torah. Without him, there wouldn't be Mishnah and Gemara. So he saved Judaism, he saved the Torah. He was the continuation of David HaMelech. Thanks to him, we're going to have Mashiach. He was the president of the Jewish nation. He did Slichot in Elul, 40 days from Rosh Chodesh Elul until Yom Kippur for 13 years, 40 days, not 45 minutes like us. Yalla, yalla, yag nidot, faster! Skip this one, you don't need. Zikaron lefanech, abash mara, there's two more pages. Skip to zikaron. We have to go to work. Many people here living thanks to the slichot, you know? Thousands of people were supposed to die that day in September 11. You know why they got saved? Because it was Elul. And everybody was saying Slichot, Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. I think it was the first day of Slichot of the Ashkenazim, Baruch Hashem. Because Ashkenazim only do one week before, or a few days before. Sfaradim do from Rosh Chodesh Elul until Yom Kippur, 40 days. So the Sfaradim already did Slichot, but the Ashkenazim just started that day. Or the day before, I don't remember exactly. But they were mamash... Huh? It must be the second as we started the night, the first night. You started the night before? We started Motsi Shabbos. You started Motsi Shabbos? And September 11, what day of the week was it? Monday. Monday? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they started Sunday. Motsi Shabbos is Sunday already. So one day before the Ashkenazim started the Slichot, and many of them worked in the, in the Twin Towers. Because the Slichot made them come almost an hour later to work, nine-ish in the morning, the plane hit the building. So until today, they live for more than 20 years thanks to the Slichot. And when there is Slichot today, can you do it uh, faster? We're in a rush. <laughs> Where are you in a rush? You know, I tell you something. I can respect a person that wants to get to work on time. Maybe he's afraid of his boss. Time is hard as it is. If you lose your job, you may sit home two years until you find another job. I respect it. I'm not making fun. But I have sometimes a question to ask. Sometimes people are so in a rush to finish the davening, and then they stand by the coffee machine 15 minutes making phone calls and drinking coffee from the machine. Apparently, they're not so much in a rush to go to work. So what was this whole rush? Ah, the coffee would run maybe. Coffee machine would run away. 
I once told somebody that likes to dive and fast in one shul. I asked him, let me ask you a question. Why are you so allergic to that fila? What's going to be if we're going to be in a synagogue on Shabbat? 15 more minutes. Instead of 10.15, we leave 10.30. Started at 8 until 10.30 instead of 10.15. All this stress to save 10 minutes. So, ah, it's Torah Tzibur. <laughs> you know what Torah Tzibur means? You're not allowed to torture the public. I say, okay, but between me and you, every Shabbos when we finish davening, what do you do? Stand over here for 40 minutes and speak about the biggest nonsense you can hear about. Talk about this, and talk about Trump, and talk about Sleepy Joe, and talk about the stock market, and who knows what else you talk about. You're not in a rush anywhere. The meal in his house starts after 12. So what is the difference if he's going to pray 10, 15 more minutes beautifully for Hashem? It's It's not in a rush anywhere. Shabbat. Where is he going to go? One reason only. The Satan is drilling in your head. Look how they waste time. Look what fanatic they are. It's enough. You should find yourself a better minion. They smear the time too much. They're wasting time here. Too many fanatics here. Find a modern minion. You don't need such a fanatic minion. Believe me, when you move to the next world, you're going to miss that minion so bad. You will give everything you can to go back to that minion. To have an extra 15 minutes every Shabbat. Extra fi- I remember one time I went to Daven by Satmir, the old Satmir in Monsi, the old building, before they made a nice bu- new building. We were eight Hasidim, myself and another Yemenite guy from Monsi, Temani, but old fashioned Temani, meaning like the old days. So we are exactly 10, and this is the last minyan, 10 to 1 at night. Meaning at 1.05, it's midnight. No more minyanim after that. Last minyan. I came from a lecture, the Temani was in Monsi, the eight Hasidim are from Monsi. That's why it's such a small minyan, because it's the last minyan. One daven already earlier. So you know how the Hasidim now, everybody looks at each other, who's going to go to, to pray? They're looking for volunteer. Me, 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 me. They look at me, me. Not me. I'm going to dab in Sephardi. You won't understand what I say anyway. I rather try to understand what you say than you try to understand what I say. Then nobody wanted to dab in. They look at the Temani, me. I promise you one thing. Today we are more than 20 years after that me. And they still have nightmare from that me until today. <laughs> And they say to the Temani, Ni? 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 He took Talit. One o'clock at night. Shhh. <laughs> what are you doing in Hebrew? What are you doing now when they hear Hebrew? They're allergic to Hebrew. Satmer. Oh my God, you're contaminating the soul. You're a Zionist. But how am I going to tell him what are you now doing in front of these Hasidim when you're making Bushot? But he doesn't care. Like this, head to the wall. He started to daven in a Yemenite style. Oh, but they have so many mizmorim. <laughs> and I see this ten Hasidim, they're dying to go to bed. 1.15 already at night. And who do they blame? Who is the closest to the Temani in a room? <laughs> I became his lawyer. They all look at me. Who's master? What? I said. Like this. And they keep looking at the watch. They're going crazy. And he doesn't even look at them. Shir da malot. Da 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 da. One thirty already. My Yeshever Rachel. Until today, every time I see him, I remind him about nights. They wanted me to be Chazan. I do it my way. By the way, what he did was allowed or not? I oh, have to respect the law of the place. If you come to a synagogue 
you have your own nosach, and they daven in a little bit different nosach. You know, there's different nosachim from different countries. When you come, if you pray by yourself quietly, you daven your nosach, no problem. You don't interfere with their nosach. But if they ask you to be chazan, or you want to say kadis, or you want to be chazan, you have to follow the law of the place. You can't change from their customs there. So what happens if you come and you insist to daven your style? But they're not used to it. They have different, even, it's enough that they don't understand your accent, now you're changing the order of the davening. So now it's depend on a machloket between the Rambam and the Rosh, two of the biggest rabbis in the last thousand years in Halacha, on the pasuk in the Torah, lo titgodedu. You do not, you're not allowed to make groups among groups. Lit Goded is agudot agudot, like agudat Israel, meaning uh, like a unity. So you have a hundred people in a synagogue, 20 of them wants to make a separate group and follow different customs in the same minyan. You do it your way, we'll do it in the same room. It's going to make a salad here. You mess up the place. So you have to follow the law, the law of the place. When the place was built, in such Nosach, Sfarad, Ashkenaz, Edot Amizrach, Temani, Hasidish, whatever it was, you have to follow the Nosach. Everybody knows that, but the question is, how come some people don't care about it? They insist to pray their way. How come? I'll tell you why. There is a machloket between the Rambam and the Rosh, what is the meaning of this verse in the Torah? According to the Rosh, you're not allowed to do agudot agudot. Rosh is the head rabbi of the Ashkenazim in the last thousand years. The biggest posek halacha in Ashkenaz in the last thousand years is Rabbi Asher, the father of Baal Aturim. <laughs> he lived about 800 years ago. He was one of the three poskim that Rabbi Yosef Karo took to the Shulchan Aruch because he needed three and to follow the majority among the three. So he took the top three, the Rif, the Rambam, and the Rosh. Three top authorities in Halacha. The Rosh, it happened to be Ashkenazi, Ashkenaz. So whatever his Psakim is, most of the Ashkenazim follow, the Rama and other Ashkenazim. So what happened? The Rosh explained this Pasuk, you're not allowed to make a group that actually rebel about the law of the place. If you come to a city and the place of the city has this minag, don't change the minag, don't change the custom, don't change the way you look, your dress, the way you pray. Leave the law of the place and join it or go to a different place. But over here, follow the place. The Rambam said the meaning of this verse is different. It means do not make a bad din of your own in a place that there was already a bed din. There is already a court, Ashkenazi court. Some of the ruling between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim are different. Dinem Amonot, different ways. If there is a, an Ashkenaz city, everybody here follow the Ashkenaz law, and you want to make now a Sfaradi bed din over here that will contradict the law of the place. According to the Rambam, you make bed din that contradict a bed din in the same place, that's a problem. But in the custom of yourself, if everybody sit and you stand, you're not breaking any law. Any law. If everyone pray without the talit, and you want to put talit like the temanim put in mincha, even though they look exceptional, they don't break this rule, lot it go they do. But according to the Ashkenazim, they are breaking the rule. So we have a very unique situation. You have a person that is temani in Minyan of Ashkenazim, he put a talit in Mincha. All the Ashkenazim daven without talit. Nusach Ashkenaz. Nusach Ashkenaz. Now only the Chazan. Now, only the Chazan. I'm talking everyone in the temanim, all of them put talit. They're all people. So the question is, if the Temani put the Talit inside an Ashkenaz shul, according to him, he doesn't break any rule. But according to them, he breaks the rule of Lotit Godedu. So we have a very unique situation. In your eyes, I'm a sinner. In my eyes, I did nothing wrong. I am right and you are right. Do you understand what's happening here? Therefore, as results of that, what's the smartest thing to do? Don't do things that are unique 
that attracts attention, and everybody now, instead of praying, getting angry, upsetting the people, who this guy think he is, creates machloket. Better to give in. Hashem loves people that put their ego down and give in. The students of Avraham Avinu. If he was Avraham Avinu, coming to a place of European Jews, he was from Kurdistan. The first Jew was Kurdish. Ur Kasdim, where is Avraham Avinu? Kur Kurdistan, between Iraq, Iran, and Turkey. That area where the Kurdish are. Na Aram Naharain. And he came to, uh, to Eretz Israel. That's the origin of Avraham Avinu in Iraq, in Babel. Later on, all the Jews came from him. So technically, all the Jews are children of a Middle Eastern Jew. There was no European Jews yet until very, very much later. All the, all the names that you read in the Gemara, it was all in Babel or in Iran, in, in Persia. Some of the Tanaim live on the other side of the border in Persia, which is also the Middle East. And some of the Chachamim lived in Eretz Israel. But there was no Ashkenazim yet. There's no Europe. Jews went to Europe later on, much, much later on, hundreds of years after the Talmud. They started to go to Italy and France and to all these places, and that's how you started to have communities in Germany and other places later on in time. And now, Baruch Hashem, we have all kinds of cultures. I want to just finish by reading to you the continuation of the words of Rav Leib Hasman. We finish here. People can learn one is generous, one is flattering the other, one is happy that the other is growing. And the other one cannot stand that his friend is growing. He cannot stand that someone made money. He cannot stand that one student now in the last year made a great progress. Instead of being happy that other Jews are growing spiritually, that, his, that her friend is now much more modest, that her friend became much more serious in davening, that she now comes to shul, until now she never came to shul. Instead of being happy, She's sick at home. Why are you sick? Don't ask, I don't feel good today. Why she doesn't feel good? Because her cousin became more righteous than her. Someone that loves Hashem, if he sees that his friends became better than him in religion, should be happy or upset? Happy. Should be happy for him and upset for me. Meaning, the Torah allows to be jealous with someone's spirituality. If he grew in Torah, I can be jealous why I didn't grow like him. I'm very happy for him. God forbid, I don't want him to go down. For him, I'm happy. I'm very, very happy for you. I'm, I congratulate you. I'm only upset at myself why I did not invest like you did. Why I didn't achieve your achievement. I'm allowed to be jealous with you in Torah. I'm allowed to be jealous with you in modesty. I'm allowed to be jealous with you with your chesed. I'm allowed to be jealous with you with your midot, with your great personality. When I see a tzaddik, immediately I'm jealous with him. Automatically. Immediately I think, ah, if I, if I was only Rabbi Yaakov Ades, oh, what a happy man I would be. Imagine if I was like Rav Dov Cook or of Mordechai Steiner, all these big tzaddikim that attached to HaKadosh Baruch Hu 24-7 every moment of their life with no nonsense, without seeing all kinds of reshaim, without listening to all the kfirah that I have to hear, living a perfect, pure life from the minute you're born in some yeshiva, 80 years of purity and Torah and devotion and attachment to Hashem and the light of God is on you every second of your life. You have to come to the Kotel and see Rabbi Yaakov Ades, how he pray every day. The day we pray on Yom Kippur, like he pray regular Shachrit, then you'll know we reach a very high level. But for him, every day is Yom Kippur. How can you pray every day for 50 years with crying to the sky with screams? Every time. Now one time you went out of your rule. How can you do it? What, are you a robot? You don't have ups and downs? How can you pray to God with tears and screaming 
like this from morning to night for 50 years, 45 years like this. And it's not only righteousness, he knows the whole Torah by heart, the whole Shas, every line, every word, every page. He has dozens of books, each book is 2,000 pages. They don't even print it. Nobody understands the level of his Torah. He's a whole different planet from the generation. Super genius, photographic memory, highest level of tzaddikut, righteousness, living in the most simple possible way, attached to the Shekhinah non-stop, crying for the situation of Am Israel non-stop, and lives in our generation. When you see someone like this and you're not jealous, you're not normal. You have to cry that you're not jealous with him. Who are you jealous with, Lebron? Who are you jealous with? With Sleepy Joe? With Bill Clinton? With who? With Bernie Sanders? Hussein Obama? Who are your heroes? This baseball guy, or the football guy, or the basketball guy? Or the boxer who breaks people's face for a few million dollars? Some monster, every day new monster. Who are the Jews jealous with? Listen to their conversation. They go in a restaurant, go to the glad kosher restaurant, put a recorder and sit in your office and listen. Put, put it in a, in a restaurant, in a table, sit in the office from morning to night and listen to the nonsense that the religious people speak in the table. You're not going to believe the nonsense they talk about, especially the Americans. The American culture is so rotten, it's unbelievable, that people have a yarmulke with a beard and you expect them to be orthodox and they're worse than the secular people. They know every player in the league, they know every contract in the league, every coach, every football player in the college, every college team. Ask them one page of Gemara to explain deeply, they don't know. With art scroll. But I can tell you every contract of every player in the NBA or anywhere else. They'll tell you every steak, what part of the animal and what dessert and who's the chef and, the, and the, everything. They know every restaurant, they know every vacation resort, resort, they know the yachts, they know all the marinas, they know in Miami every hotel. And in the end they really think that they are religious with such culture of goyim. You see what time they arrive to shul in the morning? It's barely mincha already. You see how they behave in a business. You see how they talk to their customers. You see their level of emunah, and you want to cry. With this kind of people, you definitely don't want to be jealous, even though they make millions. Many millions, so what? The millions will remain here and they will only cry that they will say goodbye to those millions, not even getting to enjoy them. Many of them leave the money. I will say, Osher, Shelo be Yosher, Bachatsi Amav Yazvenu. Someone who makes a wealth in a dishonest way is guaranteed to lose it in half of his days, meaning either he die young or the money would leave him when he's young, one of the two. But he won't even get to enjoy that money. Government, FBI, his children, his drug addict son, well, you know, all kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. Reality, Rabotai, we are now getting close to Elul, that's it, soon is Tisha B'Av, right after that shortly Elul, almost is here, almost Elul. For you realize, it's gonna be slichot around the corner. If you wake up a day or two before Rosh Hashanah and thinking that in two days you'll be able to save the year, by now it's going to be probably too late. There's so much to fix. Money that you owe people. Money that you owe suppliers. Money that you owe the credit card companies. The loans that you took. All the scams that you did in the mortgages. When are you going to fix all of that? No, Rabbi, it's banks, it's Goim, it's insurance companies, it's not people. I never steal from people, I only steal from companies. Listen to yourself. 
But I don't have the money, I really went bankrupt. Okay, it can happen. Righteous people can go bankrupt. They took a loan for a house, business went bad, COVID came, business did not make money. After a year or two, I lost the business. They can't pay the bills. So what's the solution? Call the people you owe the money, apologize. I'm so ashamed, I'm so sorry, I owe you X amount of money. You can take the house, I mortgage the house to you. Uh, or I can work out a deal with you. I give you a little bit every month, or I give you 10% on a dollar, or 20% on that. Something that you will forgive me. You can get away without paying anything in America. Basically, no one will do anything. They'll give up on you after a while. But you're going to be very surprised when you come in front of Hashem. You're going to find out you owe so much money to so many goyim and companies and people that own, own stock in those companies. Why do you think if you steal from a company on Wall Street money or from an insurance company or from a mortgage bank, do you know how many Jews own it? Could be your cousin and your uncle. You could steal from your own father. You don't know what, what stocks your father buy. Maybe at the time you defaulted on your loan, your, your father and your uncle owned shares in this bank. The stock went down in the end of the year because many people like you did not pay their loans. You stole from your own father, indirectly, but you did. <laughs> and thousands of others. And if it's Goim, you're also not allowed to steal from Goim. Not allowed, it's against the law. So what's the solution? Negotiate a settlement. Usually all people, creditors that you owe the money, willing to negotiate an unbelievable deal. 10% on the loan, that's it. They'll take it. For them it's a lost money and they will send you a mechila, waiver. And you just got away with 90% legally. Legally, they actually mochel. Say so here, give us 10%, we let go. We don't sue you, we don't go after you. We understand, you have problem, give us 10%, better than nothing. Great bargain. Some people are so greedy, even the 10% they don't wanna give. They don't wanna give. You see? Some friends are religious friends, until it comes to the money. As soon as there's money issues, you see the real face of a person. Right away. I repeat what I've been telling you for months and for years. Between now and Elul, double and triple the amount of charity you give. The world is shaking. Everything can fall in a minute. Everything can collapse in a minute. 2008 is around the corner can be 10 times worse. We don't know. Only Hashem knows what He's preparing for us. We don't know what happened today in Tehran. We don't know what's happening behind the scene. We don't know what's waiting for the Jewish nation. We don't know what's waiting for the Jews here in America. We don't know what level of antisemitism is going to be here in the next two, three years. When a million goyim would lose their homes as results of uh, defaulting on their mortgages and loans. Everything costs double and triple. People cannot pay the electric bill, gas bills, the credit card bills accumulate interest. People collapsing. There are, are going to be many goyim collapsing. And many of them are Nazis. Many of them are fanatic Muslim murderers. Many of them are allergic to Jews as it is, even when they live the life. Do you know how angry they're gonna walk around and see with your yamaka, with your Mercedes, and your expensive watch, and sitting in a fancy restaurant over here? Do you know what riots can come in a minute? You don't know, every day didn't happen is a miracle, I promise you, a huge miracle. We take it for granted, Hashem is watching, Hashem is watching. Sometimes Hashem loses patience to us. In case you didn't realize, check the Holocaust for a few years, what happened? Hashem was around, but look what happened. Check the solution. the solution is to do serious tshuva, everyone to make a list of what he has to improve, and start working on it. Praying better, giving a lot more tzedakah, dressing like a Jew. If you're a girl, make sure to dress super modest. Enough with the fashion garbage that you get all kinds of idea from all these stupid magazines. Enough with these fancy schmancifications. Enough with these fancy cars and all this greed. Enough with all this jewelry. Enough with all this nonsense. Focus on simple life. 
on life with devotion to Torah and Hashem, with raising children to be down to earth simple people, doesn't matter how many millions you have in investment right now. Today you have it, tomorrow you have nothing. You don't know what's going to be with you in a year. How many people went to sleep, billionaires, and a week later they didn't have money. Roman Abramovich was third, or had 30 billion dollars. Overnight they froze all his assets. He went to all his friends. He has a yacht worth 350 million dollars. He owns houses, property in Israel that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He owns a soccer team that worth three billion dollars. He owns oil and investment and money and houses here. A dinner for him was $65,000 in average here in Manhattan. A dinner. $65,000 on his credit card bill, I saw the receipt. Overnight, he didn't have what to eat. He couldn't pay his gardener, his driver, his bodyguards. He wanted to borrow one million dollars from all the friends that he helped and helped and gave them money and helped and found them jobs and set them up and bought them real estate. Now one of his friends agreed to lend him one million dollars, which is peanuts for them. We're talking people that make it in a day, his friends. In a day, they make a million dollar net. You don't sacrifice one day to your friend that helps so much to you, now one agreed to lend him one million dollars. I don't know what he did in the end. So far he's surviving. They froze all his assets because of Putin. American justice. You have a friend that America hates, they go after you because they're afraid to go after your dangerous friend, meaning Putin. So they can't mess with Putin, so somebody like Putin and he's his friend, let's torture him to hurt Putin. The Torah doesn't allow such thing. The Torah says everybody has to pay for his own crimes. He's your friend. What does that have to do with me? I told him to kill. I told him to attack Ukraine. I told him to do what he does, but I control him. He listens to me. I can tell him do or do not. You know he's not going to listen to me. So I'm his friend. I was his friend until now. Now he decided to go crazy. Why do I have to lose all my money? Why? Because America. <laughs> That's America. Rabotai, if you cannot do mitzvot, at least buy them. Buy the mitzvot. Multiply the amount of donations, triple them, make monthly donations. We have to save people. We have to save souls. Soon the boat is going to drown, and who's going to be saved? Only the ones that we're going to take out of being Mechalel Shabbat and make them Shomre Shabbat. People that eat pigs, porks, we save them. People that didn't believe in God, we, we turned them into believers. You understand what I'm saying here or no? Everyone who wants free CDs, please send me an email, rabbimizrahi at gmail.com. You can come to Brooklyn and pick them up. You can go to Queens and pick them up on Monday night. Or you can just pay the shipping and we'll ship it to you to anywhere you are. But the CDs you can get for free and give them out. And who knows, in less than a year, there's not going to be any more CDs left in the world. As it is now, 50% of the people don't have CDs anymore. In cars, in computers, they don't make CDs anymore. Some people have that still in their DVD player, but soon this is going to be over from the world. So we still have CDs, we might as well use them. Just take them for free, you don't have to pay. It used to be a dollar a CD. You can get 100, 200, 500 CDs for free. Better you pick them up. Less headache, less shipping. If you cannot pick them up in Brooklyn or in Queens or in Monsey, we'll ship them to you, whatever the cost is going to be. Pay just the shipping, give, get the CDs and put them out. Put them in places that people have access to it, they listen to it. Just today someone from Israel sent me today a message that now he had my CD packed to the jazz for three years on his desk. And today he put it in for the first time and listened to the entire CDs. This is almost 30 years, uh, 30 hours. That CD between yesterday and today, 30 hours. And he now is in very high spiritual level after he listened to that CD. He's in. Another soul got saved for one dollar CD. One dollar saved the soul. Now it's not even a dollar. You can get it for free. Just, just put them in places, car wash, supermarket, bookstore. Put them in places where people go, restaurants. 
I don't know where. You find a place where to put them. People will take them. What's comes up? Put them in the garbage. In a few months, they're going to go to the garbage anyway. You might as well take advantage. Save other people, Bezrat Hashem. Thursday, I have another lecture here in Brooklyn. You have on my calendar the address. Everyone is welcome. It's open for the public. It's going to be in English. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer. Atzah Kadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot et Yisrael.